Hello and welcome to another episode of Rebel City Podcast. The song that I'm playing is Loverboy by Joseph. Um, he's a new Glasgow artist. He's playing at the King Tut Summer Nights Festival on the 31st of August. I think it might be sold out. It's an absolute fucking tune. Anyway, this week's episode of Rebel City, we have James Maguire. Now, James is one third of um, Drunk Therapy podcast, and we had James in a couple of weeks ago, just after Celtic had won eight in a row. Um, it was a pleasure to have James. Um, obviously, with the timing of the podcast, we spoke about Celtic. Um, we spoke about the differences between the celebrations of winning eight in a row and stopping ten in a row. Um, we spoke about next season. We each had a sort of bit of input on who we fancied for manager and what we need next season. Um, we spoke about an SPFL Megazord that would come together to try and stop ten in a row. We also spoke about Scottish Twitter telling uh, Mikel Lustig's missus to give him the big A after he'd scored the goal at Pataudry and had a bit of a giggle about that. Um, both me and James have been in bands and on different sort of spectrums of the music scene, but we talk about how we were trying to sort of top trump each other in the DMs about our eclectic music tastes, um, what it was like being in the Glasgow music scene, MySpace still existing, and the evolution of social media. And that was sort of the, the rapport building conversation that we had at the start. But then we got on to um, his experiences with gambling and addiction. And although James is planning <clears throat> on uh, doing an episode of Drunk Therapy where he really goes into it, he gave us a sort of glimpse into what his life was like while he was a gambling addict. And he tells a very powerful story about suicidal thoughts, suicide attempts, and um, his recovery. Um, I can't thank James enough for coming in. Uh, both me and Matt went on drunk therapy um, a week after we did this with James, and we had an absolute laugh <laughs> with him and the, the other guys. It was a great Saturday night. And hopefully we're going to have the other two guys from drunk therapy coming in and doing a Rebel City episode. But without further ado, just going to get into the episode and play you a wee bit more of Loverboy. So, James McGuire, how's it going, mate? Brilliant, mate, brilliant. How are you guys? Thanks for having me on. No, it's no, mate, it's good to see you. It's good. a nice Sunday to get you in, mate, after winning eight in a row yesterday. It's fucking brilliant, wasn't it? Oh. We were talking about it all our own, mate. It was just... Aye. I didn't see it. I went to kickboxing because I was just like, so if it's going to be in like, the last couple of weeks, I, I don't know if I want to watch it. But I, I delighted with the fucking result, man. See, yeah. I'd, 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 ca I'd class myself as a casual football fan, but a big Celtic fan. Okay. Like, not not a, a huge, huge Celtic fan. Mm. Like, you see some diehards. But yesterday, I, was, I just kind of felt like what well, we're taking it for granted, didn't we? Eight in a mm. row. I was driving through the city and yeah. there's no parties. I remember the big parties when we stopped... The the ten, ten, ah, you know, down the garden, ah. that it was fucking, it was amazing. There was people just beating their horns, flags at the windy, and you're sitting there with eight in a row, and it's just like, aye, we've aye. done it, we achieved it. Aye, we'll celebrate the treble. I remember one year pretty. being down the Gallagate, and it was just, it was so busy that it was literally like getting tables and chairs out for everybody. The pure plastic numbers that were like a ten out of being queued just chucked everywhere. And I don't think that's the case anymore either, is it? No, uh, do you think we're getting numpty success? <laughs> a bit, aye, aye, a bit. Especially so much in the last couple of years. If we're talking about a treble treble here, you're just like, what the fuck? Um, I don't know. I quite, uh, I'm quite. a season tick holder. I don't get out to a lot of your games. I'll get to Hamden pretty regular and stuff like that with the team. But uh, I quite, uh, something about it, I quite liked that it was away for him. I don't know why. I, I should have been 
wanting to be in the stadium when you know we done it and having Celtic Park pure rotten. But like, I I kind of like that it was done away for him and you go to the scenes of the, the away fans and stuff going absolutely torn. So the wee guy that got like the wee daddy Scott wee Brown's brown. jersey, man, you're just like... She's face, man. Brown, that's, the, that's the stuff, man. Not pure, just fire it straight in my veins. Aye, 100%, <laughs> man. But the team's been... I mean, I was literally like... I think this might be why, because when I seen that they had won, I was walking him for um, a, cl- like a class and I was like... That, that's like no, do you know what we need to do? We need to rebuild. Mm. Like we've been so shit, like the last eighteen months, pretty much on and off, other than the, the odd game here and there. Like I, I think the first Rangers game at home this season, um, the Scottish Cup final last season, but we've been really fucking terrible, man. Like it's not been pretty to watch at all, and I think we've let them closer to us than what we should have mm. because. And I, I was just thinking, thank God, so it was like relief. But then the first thought was, who are we buying in the summer? Because we need to be nine and ten in a row. Like that's it. The fucking ultimate for me, man. We really need somebody solid in there that's going to fucking put a firm hand at the board mm-hmm. and say this is what we need. Mm-hmm. I kind of, I'm no, I'm not massively sold in Neil Lennon taking us forward, but I like what he's done with his own players. Benkovic is the best defender by far in a way, and. Boy, yeah, is obviously off, and he mm-hmm. just went. I'm going to stick the central defenders out there that are going to be here with us next season yep. and get them to take it over the line. dividends as well. I mean, guys like Semenyevich, who I was talking about it in my my sort of Celtic group chat with the lads in the work, and uh, the other week there, and Semenyevich and Lustig look like Different players, players reborn under Neil Lennon. You know what I mean? And there's Semenyevich who scored two goals this season. It was a one all last week and the clincher this week. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And Did we, you see Lustig's missus on Twitter? She was like, that's my husband, and somebody retweeted it and says, let him stick it in your arse tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, she's a beautiful woman, though, isn't she? Aye, she's something else, man. Like, aye, one. but I think, to be fair, he's a decent-looking guy as well. I think aye. he looked a wee bit strange when he first signed, when he had mm. the curtains and stuff, but he's got that sort of Swedish blood. The yeah. two of them have, man. Like, I certainly Definitely. Would. <laughs> just when he's scoring diving headers. Aye, just aye. when he's scoring goals like that. Pitaudry. They were saying that's the first time that the league's been clinched at Pitaudry since 1987. Wow. So, I mean, that just shows how shite they fucking are now. I've mean, always thought Aberdeen were a bit of a joke challenge to me. And I know, obviously, we've talked about them in recent years as like the challengers to the title and blah, blah, blah. But that was just because they were the second place team. I don't know that they were ever. I nah. don't particularly feel threatened by Aberdeen in any meaningful capacity at any point in this supposed period of unparalleled success for them. You know what I mean? Someone but asked that question. Sky Sports do this ridiculous thing. Mm. Their coverage is terrible, but they get people to tweet in questions and then they ask them like they're serious journalists. <laughs> and it was... Chris Boyd. Well, <laughs> Chris Boyd, James McFadden, and Commons just sitting there. David, like, 1872, and <laughs> <Kilmarmont> asks... <laughs> and one of the questions was, what do Rangers and Aberdeen need to do to seriously threaten for this title next year? And Probably like, like, join forces and like create like a Megazord like <laughs> style of football club an SPFL 11 versus Celtic like that's week. what they would need to do that's what they're trying to do but it's ridiculous to even the, the concept of Aberdeen challenging Celtic it's mm. never going to happen I, I still don't think Rangers should challenge next season no, I don't think I they're don't good think enough they at all they're a terrible team it might be difficult I mean you know they're signing a lot of like Bosmans um, you know people who in SPL terms are probably reasonable signings on paper Obviously, Jordan Jones has got a good track record. You know, the boy Kamara looks like he's making a reasonable impact, if we're being fair. Um, but Hasty's probably a wee bit unproven for me. There's talk of Shinny, potentially. You've already got guys like Jack and Halliday. You're like, what? It's, it's like a, a all-star 11 or like SPL losers. I mean, if your whole transfer policy is to sign players that already can beat Celtic, how do you expect to then beat Celtic? I don't know. That makes mm. sense. Makes we sense. did a bit of that ourselves, didn't we? I mean, under and it never really worked out. I mean, if you think about Martin O'Neill's team, you think about like what was that starting eleven like? But we signed so many players for like Livingston, Stephen Dundee, Pearson, Stephen Pearson's. What was that? Fernandez, S- Fernandez, like Spanish guy. It never really worked out. It was always Sutton, Larson, Hartson. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Petrov, Lambert. It was always that team, and we tried to bring in these guys that showed promise from the SPL. The only real one that I can think of. That I'm like, ah, it was Scott McDonald. Mm. Aye. He came in and did a serious job for us, man. Yeah, had mm-hmm. the likes of Barry Robson and all that over time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there's been some decent players that, that come from the... downfall, though, because 
that season, that last season under Stratton, when they went out and bought Mendes and Stephen Davis, and then we were we had we still had Paul Hartley and Barry Robson, who the season before had totally like went for it and dragged us out of the line. The next season we were like, ah shit, like they've just went and and upgraded. Aye, and so I think that that will probably happen to them, but I hope that they don't have that one season. Do you know what I mean? Where they just do like really well, or we. It's going to depend on the manager, isn't it? Who who we get in? I mean. Obviously, it's going to be difficult for you know somebody to make a better case than Lenny. As much as I agree with you, and I don't think he's necessarily the guy, but I'd love to see him included in you know Kennedy, Duff, and the backroom staff or whoever comes in to keep them grounded in what the club's actually about. But I heard during the week that you know Slavin Bilic was getting sort of banded about, and like that's one of the names that I was like instantly like pure eye. Oh, I would, definitely. I would love somebody like that. He was rumoured before. What was it? Neil <clears> or <throat> after Neil? Yeah. Years yeah. ago, when he was a Croatia manager, and I mm-hmm. think he's a brilliant guy. He's very, very level-headed when yep. it comes to football. Mm-hmm. He's one of the guys you can enjoy being a pundit as well mm-hmm. as being a manager. He's sharp. He's organised. He knows how to build a team because that Croatian team, even mm-hmm. when he's no in charge of them, the, the last uh, the last World Cup there, they were the oldest. Squad wasn't a player below 29, they'd been together 10 12 years. You're like, that's a kind of you know unit that he's put together and then has left it in good shape for somebody else to take over and carry it forward. And like, that's exactly the type of thing we're looking to happen here. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I would, I'm, I think it's going to be Moyes. I think he's got to Scotland by the looks of it because so. we've seen him at the Celtic game been last week games, and then he was at like three games that weekend. And I think he was right. more likely. Sizing up Scotland players than Celtic players. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping so anyway. I mean, I've seen a lot of chat about him and a lot of people, a lot of negativity around about him. And I, all right, at Sunderland, he was fighting a losing battle. Man aye. United, he was never going to be a fucking success at Man United. Take balls take, to follow Ferguson. But take, take Neil Ferguson. And he, and well, Ferguson didn't leave a great team either. No. no. It's like who, whoever's coming in to Celtic right now, that's the exact same situation. Yeah, mm. they've won the league, but the team's kind of depleted. He needs to sort of build a, lot a of people team. Out. He did a great job at Everton, though. Mm-hmm. A fantastic job at Everton. Aye, and he was there 10 years. And he fucking, he took care of... Walt, Walter Smith had absolutely like left him devastated budget mm. wise he'd spent so much money and he was told like you've got no money but you need to yeah. try and get into Europe and he did that so even though I wouldn't he wouldn't be my first choice and I wouldn't be delighted with it I, would, I think I'd be I'd be happy I I'd thought as a baseline I'd be alright with that he doesn't uh, play attacking football though does he Moise we just need to win 10 in a row. Like, <laughs> I don't give a fuck how we do it, man, in the next I think two years. Somebody like Billich for me is a better bet because I, I don't know, man. I think the pressure in the next two years is going to get so intense. And I think a lot of um, former Rangers players have spoken on things like you know, Simon Ferry and whatnot about when they got the nine done, like the pressure on them to get to the 10 was just unbearable. And that is something that I think if you're a Celtic man in charge of the club, might be a wee bit to somebody like Lenny. I don't know that I want. Lenny under the pressure Aye, that man. 10's going to bring, but see somebody like a village who can actually go, right, I get it, I understand this scenario. But he can isolate but I can his emotion. Also mm. separate myself mm. from it. I think that's so, maybe uh, the way forward what, for me. What, what we did with Anson, mm. where we brought in somebody Aye. that was just like, you're here to do a job, Aye. you're not here to stop Rangers winning Park 10 in a row. Like, yeah. You're here Aye. to do a job and, and hopefully you Aye. can do it. But Park the rest it and just get it done. It'll be an interesting summer because we've got European qualifiers coming up and what? Nine weeks, do you know what I mean? So we, they need to turn it around. Yeah, yeah. Then we've got Champions League qualifiers. What three weeks after that? That's it. Aye, like last week in July, maybe in July or something. Mm-hmm. Like and we're coming into like May, so I were talking like two and a half months away for fucking Champions League qualifiers. And I am hoping they've got a fucking plan because it's almost every year it's been like, what's the plan? Other than Rogers, <coughs> mm-hmm. it's almost seemed like we don't have a plan. Yeah. You're identifying the exact same things. We need a right back, we need a centre back. I know, man. Need same a... shit we were saying under Dyla, so <laughs> it'll be an interesting summer, that's for fucking sure. Definitely. I seen a tweet yesterday from one of my mates who's a diehard fan, he's in the Green Brigade, mm-hmm. and um, he said, for all the heartache that I suffered during the 90s, because it was horrible, mm-hmm. we can all agree on oh, that. Definitely. It was fucking oh, yeah, horrible. Um, seeing his son see Celtic achieve all the success makes all the more meaningful yeah. and uh, you asked earlier if are we numb to success maybe we've just you know we've, we've, we've not seen it through the eyes of a kid mm-hmm. that's going this is my team blah 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 yeah. we've got more things in our life but mm-hmm. for this kid Celtic is absolutely everything mm-hmm. and he's seen his team winning that's, there's something fucking beautiful aye. about that aye 100% I think we're almost bringing through a level of support that 
I hated on the other side in the nineties. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like born we had, into the success. We'll name any names just in case because we <laughs> they, they they happen to listen to the podcast. But we knew guys that were literally like at school wearing Rangers tops and then seeing them like three years later under a nil going to Celtic Park with Celtic season tickets and you're like, mm. uh, like really man it's fucking right. hell <laughs> and that, no it, that's that I'm worried that we're bringing through that and then you see some of the sort of like people online the way that they speak and you're just almost going mate you need to get a break man like we've I, I sat through fucking watching the likes of fucking Jerry Craney mm. while they were signing fucking world superstars Aye, do you know what I mean Paul Gascoigne and you're just Aye, sitting there it. going like what the fuck I still so remember the day we don't have people that and it seems to be that we, we do have a fair amount of them that are just like that if it's not amazing and it's not perfect it's not fucking good enough and it's like, they're willing to vilify the club with one bad decisions made mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I remember the day that they signed Ronald De Boer and I was walking up for lunch with a diehard Rangers fan and I just went this is a fucking end man uh-huh. they've, they've signed a world class player and we hadn't won anything in a few years I think Dick Advocate had just came in and completely ruined us and mm-hmm. I was like this is it this the shit who, was it we, who would we have signed that year? I'm not even sure. Raphael Shite. I took that, came in and spent Eventually. 80 million quid or something trying to win the Scottish Premier League. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, uh, well, he did, to be fair, I think he's got a couple of trebles to his name as well, if I remember right. But he's got one at least, I think. But I, 80 odd million quid to win the SPL for what? Three million quid prize money, you know what I mean? Aye, <laughs> but still, then still that's chasing that obviously why it went the way it did with him. European Cup, that's a, I think that's one of the other things before we move on is that I would hope that Celtic don't chase this. Mm. If you know what I mean, even though we do want they want it, I hope that they don't like be reckless. Do you know what I mean, and go mm. there and try and spend money that we've no go. And I don't think we will. Peter no, Lawwell seems so. like a bit of a fucking tight fisted. Right. Cunt, but I think one we know the, the sort of way. rare topic of Celtic, um, obviously the last week seen the, the death of Billy McNeil and uh, Stevie Chalmers and it's it's always a sad time but I, I've got to say I was quite like I was saying online uplifted by you know the coverage it because like seeing so many people turn out there was like people applauding the cortege at like George Square all the way up through the East End and beyond you know what I mean like, I think it was a a really cool and kind of sort of fun tribute and always a hope for the week ahead and you know similar things mm-hmm. so you'd like made me aware that myspace still exists <laughs> yeah. are we were having a wee conversation weren't we about old bands i think we all try to talk trumps each other <laughs> <laughs> how eclectic our music taster and then i threw up the sentence that i was a, a guy that was a rapper that listened to emo music at a time, and then I sent you my MySpace that's mm-hmm. still in existence for some reason. Which I couldn't believe. I couldn't get the tracks to play, and I think it was just on my phone, like my phone, even mine, like my old bands one, I mean, and it was just errors I was getting. I, was like, I, I felt the same. I, I think you need to sign up to MySpace to get any access to it right. again, nah, or have your up. old information, and I have no fucking idea what my email might, address would be. I might have the login for that. I might go mm-hmm. in and try and get <laughs> some of the stuff. But um, something that was like... I'm stuck on emo rap. <laughs> Honestly, and I worked at the Disney store as well at the time. It was a fucking mess that, of contradictions. That kind of seems like the best place for emo rap. <laughs> at the Disney store, by bright and colourful and plastic. It sounds Did you have right. like a pure one of these swoopy haircuts. I tried, mate. I tried. Are you just constantly just stunning doing that? No, I tried. I, I was a shite emo because I'm fading off of Glasgow. I liked the music <laughs> and I wanted to be gangster, and I was a wee bit all over the place with it. But I, I was. Uh, in the cat house and then the next day I would be doing a gig in like fucking Glasgow Green shouting fuck the police and stuff mm-hmm. it was a bit of a mess but MySpace to me was brilliant man see when you were growing up it was just fucking the way you get your music out, oh, out of the world definitely man it was the first I think it was the first real social media yeah I've got to say like I mean we had I, I, I can remember we played in Leeds and Joseph's Well and people were coming up to me and going oh follow you on MySpace and came to the gig and I was just like what the fuck Aye. kidding on like how the fuck has this happened and it was literally like all night it was like I had just people just coming to gigs turning up at gigs because they'd seen us on MySpace and it was like this is weird and didn't really know how to sort of feel about it but I had, we were thinking about it the other day I think we all went for like MSN Messenger and Yahoo Pool to like this sort of like oh, I can put tunes on it and then 
I can remember you could code your own profiles and stuff like that. You, you could, could make custom profiles and shit. And it was represent like, your own music taste, you know, whenever a new band came out. Because you had your personal one and then you had your band one. Mm-hmm. I remember every time that I was trying to pull a lassie mm-hmm. and you would check out their interests and then you, before you would add them or before you would message them, you would just check what bands they like and then you'd stick the best song by that band on your profile. <laughs> they could go, I check this out. And you're always trying to engage on their level. It was... It was good for trying to get your hold, but at the same time... Right. When I never used it for that. If <laughs> I didn't have a personal MySpace page. I not? just had my band's MySpace page, and I was just like doing that just constantly, and I didn't have like, my own. Oh, I was maybe... I think I felt like I was too old, Did even you? though I was... I mean, what, what year was MySpace? I think I looked I up. 2005 to 2009 was like the peak. Aye. So 2005, I was what, 22? <laughs> You felt too old for MySpace. And I was like, pure, I'm too old to have mine MySpace. I'm just going to have my band's MySpace. Sounds like a Daily Mash headline where it's like, your 22 year old feels too old for an internet. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, but it was like, it, it was, I can remember it being like starkly different to like anything that had it just been like, well, this is fucking crazy. Um, and I think we got one of the tracks, it's not there anymore. I was like, what track was it? And it was one of the tracks we did, The Devil and I, and it had like, quarter of a million clicks on MySpace and that was like a proud achievement I mean do you know what I mean like pure we wrote 250k listens on MySpace and now we, we had we had a hundred thousands on one as well and it, I, to be fair I just kept adding people from all over the world and that's what they I would did. discover yeah, our man. music I and actually had a bot I had paid for a program that was on my PC that would just add everybody on MySpace it literally just just sat and ran in the background. That blows my mind, genuinely. Like you're afraid to be on MySpace, but you you know what? Got that much knowledge that you got a bot. I know. I know. Um, but no, the, for me it was I'm kind of similar when MySpace was around, and it was kind of the early uh, adopters of YouTube as well were around at that point. Mm. I can't remember if uh, Bebo was on its way or had already been. Bebo stole. I can remember migrating to MySpace, like going, I'm going to need to leave MySpace and start the band's Bebo, and then I got a personal Bebo page and the band's Bebo. Yeah. And I was like, right, so this is the way it went. So it like evolved from MySpace to Bebo. Um, but I, I felt that Bebo wasn't quite as good. Nah, Bebo was more of, because I, I basically grew up on social media, because I had MSN Messenger, but there was a thing called Face Party before that, which was the first incarnation, not of Facebook, but of that type of social media. Mm, and it was right. just about adding people and yeah. kind of making friends in the local area. Um, and then MySpace came about. So I'd, I'd kind of uh, grown up, and <clears> MySpace for me is and always will be about creativity and arts. Uh, mm-hmm. And then kind of fitting in with people of that ilk, you know, you could always uh, yeah. jump in their space and go, right, this is what we're all about, this is our little community. Whereas Facebook, Bebo and all that, it was just about getting to know people, sharing false love, like, you know, what the Bebo loves and all that. <laughs> it wasn't a celebration <laughs> of arts. Oh, fucking hell. Right, because it went from... Picking your other half. My, uh, my first social media, is, in its current form, would probably have been Bebo. And I, I dread to think... What, is on it now. With so. the Bebo profiles all ah, yeah. I'm pretty sure there was a there was like an amnesty that happened, wasn't there? Bebo came out and went, We're shutting everything down, so if you want your pictures and whatever, you need to email us and we'll send you your password and you can go in and get it, but we're basically just deleting everything. Yeah, I remember I, that. I, I was like, nah, fuck that and I regret it. <laughs> 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 I've had some good stuff on I'm there. I'm pretty sure that I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely don't. And I wouldn't want it. There was there was some offensive stuff up there. That was when I was going through a phase of just throwing anything up, like and I had a section of quotes that if I look back at now I would fucking hate myself. Oh I, Um but I'd read to think. I, I, would, held, I would be in exactly the same boat. I held it on Facebook, but I can remember people going, You're still on Bebo? And I was like, Aye. Aye. Facebook. <laughs> Bebo forever. <laughs> You're still in my top sixteen, mate, so you should come over. <laughs> Aye. But it's it's almost like so for MySpace, MySpace was like that's really good place, like you're saying, for you to go and share, actually share, and for people to just go and look. But then Bebo, you were, it was almost like you were interacting because you could post on each other's walls. Like that was like a thing that you could do. You could go in and, like you're saying, give like love, and uh, you would be like saying to people, ah, give me your Bebo love and stuff like that. But then Facebook took it like that step further. But it's almost like the gentrification. Like everything's became gentrified, or even more, and then even more like a product, because MySpace almost felt sort of like good and like this is a really nice place, and I'm meeting all these people that you're saying like-minded people, and now Twitter and Facebook's just all like raging people that are just you know what I mean? You're like, right, there's a lot of lot of different tribes, and Facebook knows how to curate those tribes towards advertisers or communities, and mm. uh, and 
like you say, MySpace was natural. It was a space where everything was just evolving organically, yeah. whereas you have to really fit into a box, especially on Twitter. As I, I deleted um, all my social media two years ago, kind of went through a mental breakdown, went, fuck this, and it took me a while to get back onto it. Mm-hmm. And on Facebook, I've pretty much just got some family and friends. Yeah. On Twitter, I'm still trying to find my identity. I don't know where I belong on Twitter. And I've, I've been raising a banner for about two or three years to the guys in my work and say, Twitter's dead. I don't, I don't believe it will exist. It's not grown enough, you know, to adapt to the the uh, modern, uh, the modern social world, you know, the way mm-hmm. Facebook is. It's always providing you something new. Mm-hmm. I don't believe Twitter uh, has done that. The fact that it doesn't have an edit button is fucking mental to me. Oh, it my mind. But when I came back on it, it almost seemed like Scottish Twitter had exploded and become this massive tribe where there's just these uh, leaders of Scottish Twitter where they'll just throw up anything like, mm. oh, I just smash my ma with a frying pan and then they'll get like 100 likes on it. And you're Aye, like, man. the fuck is this? Mm-hmm. But it, it's there, you know, and then you've got these activists um, in the political space and they've now become leaders in that and it's just all these little tribes on it. Mm. I like that and I dislike it. And then um, Instagram, that's something I'm, I'm more prolific on Instagram because I just like posting up shit don't have to have an opinion on it no but it's all you know you need to fit into a little space in each social media i feel now mm-hmm. and i don't know if i like it no mm. whereas myspace you could just go up and say i like a band that's amazing you didn't you get know? any abuse for didn't saying me. this is my favorite band now you go on twitter and people are like how dare you put turnips in your jeans what you don't watch game of thrones you're a fucking idiot no you do watch game of thrones then you're a fucking idiot it's like can we not just like realize that everybody's different and that we don't all like the same shit. Like people saying, what's this called? Cheese on toast or toast on cheese? Cheese on toast. Oh, you're a fucking dick. But, <laughs> you know, Everybody has their enemies opinion. now. Uh, <laughs> I, and I get, I get caught in that. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the same as you, man. I don't know where I fit in because I'm no, I'm no like full of banter. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm, I think sometimes I'm a wee bit too serious, but I'm no mm. like full of banter and also I'm no full of inspirational quotes. And like you're saying on Scottish Twitter, there's a couple of people where they put, I'm getting really cynical with it, they'll post it and I'll just be like, fuck up mate, like seriously, like talking about like, <laughs> today could be your best day ever and you're like, gonna give me a fucking break, like what right, shit, get, get like do you actually believe what you're posting or are you just posting it for likes and then we had, during the week they had that lassie that posted about the network taxi driver, did you see this? No. So she posted that the guy, <coughs> I mean... I don't know if she meant it like this, but it had alluded to that the guy was basically trying to drive away well. Mm-hmm. Like, he turned his GPS off, he turned his meter off, and he wouldn't stop the motor. And she'd made out that she had opened the door and rolled out the motor. And she'd put up this big... Like, fucking so, Mission like, Impossible. Uh, <laughs> 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 like, fucking... Like, a note explaining what had happened, and then, like, the GPS to where her house was and blah, blah, blah. And then okay. Network had come out on Twitter, Network fucking private hire, and said... The reason that the, the GPS was like this was because you dropped one of your pals off and then it had turned out and she deleted the post. So she was just trying to put a complaint up there and get likes. Wanting likes and retweets, I think. That's mm-hmm. what, I mean, it had like 20 odd K like, likes when I seen it and then I'd seen it the next couple of days. It was James Faye, 90 Minutes Cynic, that had put up basically like saying with a screenshot saying, mm-hmm. like, look at their response. This is, we need to get on top of this. Like, we can't have people just going out there going, this taxi and she posted a, a photo of the guy because on wow. the app you can go in so she, so she basically post, posted a photo of the guy making out that the guy had basically tried to rip her off but then was alluding to the fact that he wouldn't let her out the car and she had to like let herself out while he was moving the car and it just turned out to be absolute fucking bullshit wow she could effectively just ruin that guy's career though or his life mm-hmm. by posting that picture up mm-hmm. and it's kind of when someone's falsely accused of a crime yeah. and then it ruins her reputation they lose her job they lose their family or friends. That you you have that power on social media. Mm-hmm. If you can craft a story that's good enough, like I could turn around right now and go right. Paul uh, broke into my house last night and threatened my my uh, my my other half. Mm-hmm. And I could craft a story so good that people might believe it, yeah. and then your name's completely tarnished. Yeah. I, I don't like the power that social media has in that. Definitely not. In that yeah, respect, I'm the same. I mean, folk getting scary as fuck. Up, you know. I'm arguing with you on Twitter and then the next thing I'll go into work on a Monday morning and my gaffer's like, hey, can you come here a minute, sit down? Like, somebody's lodged a complaint about what you've been saying online and you're like, hold on, what? Somebody has contacted my boss about something I said on my personal account in my personal time. Like, I've heard that a lot. 
You know what I mean? I don't know if it's maybe just the environment I work in and like call centers and stuff like that, but like that happens. And and I've seen also people on social media saying to each other, I wait here, boss hears about this, or so and so for XYZ company did this to me, but and you're just like, what the fuck is that? Mm-hmm. Like I don't get what the, what the motivation behind that is. Have a beef with somebody and be like, I've got a personal issue with you. I'm going to go and take it to your boss, mm-hmm. or your employer. Like it's a shitstorm, man. Because even though this lassie shouldn't have done that, I seen another tweet where people were basically saying, "Go and abuse her." As don't well, so you're do just you? like. Where does this? Where where do we draw the line? Like she's done that for likes, and it's fucking out of order, and she's had to delete the post and delete her social media and blah blah blah, and she deserves some kind of sort of ramification for doing something dark. Sounds like the... do, you, do you really want to be calling for people to get abused online? Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. so, it's... oh, it's a wash machine. Aye, so if you hear a click bell, it's my wash machine. You know? <laughs> um, but there's um, there's a guy called John Ronson. You ever heard of John Ronson? So no. men who stare at goats. No, no. You ever seen that movie? I'm sure I've seen it. Seen it oh, I've seen it. I thought you meant a Twitter account called that. No, no, no. He wrote, he wrote The Men Who Stare at Goats and he's an investigative journalist and he's done a few podcasts. So there's one called The Butterfly Effect, which is about how the guy that started Pornhub has extracted all the money out of porn and it's driving like porn stars to go and become prostitutes next one. He did the uh, last days of August, which is about August Ames, the porn star that hung herself in uh, California because... It, on the surface, it looked like she was getting abused online, and then she went and killed herself. But when you're listening to the podcast, as you would sort of guess, there was a whole load of shit that was going yeah, on in her life. Yeah. It wasn't just that. But he's wrote a book called. What's it called? So you've been publicly shamed. Yeah, so you've been publicly shamed, and it's about it's people's stories about doing silly stuff. So that that woman that went on the Virgin Atlantic flight for early to Johannesburg, and when she po- she posted a tweet saying, "I'm going to Africa. I hope I don't get AIDS." Yeah. And she turned her phone off, and when she got back after flight 14, 15 hours later, she'd been sacked. She had death threats. She'd got, like, absolutely just fucking hung, drawn, and quartered on wow. Twitter. And it's these people's stories. And you, when you... So I can remember that. And I remember going, what a fucking cow. Do you know what I mean? Like, being like, how dare she say that? Mm. But then seeing you hear it from her point of view, she was just like, I just didn't think. And I thought it was being funny. And then also that drive for... Because I do it, I'm like, see if I could say something funny here, I might get like a yeah. thousand like, likes here or whatever. It's impulse, isn't it? Ah, you're like, well, I'll make a joke of this. And she's tried to be funny and she's made a stupid mistake and it cost her her job. And she's going on about now. I mean, how many years is that since that happened? Like seven years, six, five? And it took her like a full year before she could get a job. So she, I try to get a job, but she's like, can I find a boyfriend? Because anybody that meets her on Tinder or whatever, as we do, Google people's names, I wonder what they're all about, find their social media, and they go in, they go, she's a racist. So, no, nah, I'm not going near her. Wow. So she can't get, it's like forever, like we were talking about that earlier, like pictures on your old social media that you can't get rid of. Yeah. These people are forever tarnished with this idea that they've been racist or whatever it is, and really, or they are just stupid, do you know what I mean? And they've been absolutely fucking yeah. booted fuck out of online, and, and it bleeds into their life, do you know what I mean? And, it's a shame. It's a shame, and you, you, we were touching on it there, and said you remembered when that came out. Oh, hundred percent. And you were, I don't know, were you part of the people that tweeted no, about it? I, I, I wouldn't. I would never really get involved. The only time that I really get involved with like making comments on people is if I'm saying like either that's a bit strong or they're politicians and people that are putting themselves out there publicly for criticism, and I've get legitimate criticism. But people putting shit up for like either fishing like people that put stuff up and you just know they'll just try to get people hooked and make an arse of themselves in the comments I, or i'm actually angry about it i tend to no bother yeah. um i have done in the past mm. and it's just and ended up with like with me being like why am i even engaging with these people <laughs> i'm not gonna change their mind so what's the point it's to feed my own ego it's really for me to go i stood up to them and it's like well fuck that because yeah. there's no point in that i'm not going to change anybody's opinion do you know what i mean but true well i, I try and look at the bigger picture and um, just to go back to the aids one the that woman which i, I think is ridiculous as a statement then i think you need to look at right who is this woman what's her previous tweets what is she like as a person what what you can you know garner from social media yeah. and then make an educated decision on whether or not that woman is a an actual cunt that represents these values and feelings Mm -hmm. because you've just had a bunch of hot-headed people run in and then you know jump on a cause 
Right. And therefore, nine years later, it's ruined this woman's life. And I'm not saying she shouldn't have got any ramifications for that tweet, but it should have maybe been a quiet word for the people that know and love her. And say, yeah. I mean, sort I it mean, out. I, don't, I, shake, I, I think that one of the problems, part of the problem was, is that it stayed there for like 15 hours. And I think there was a lot of people that were saying, why are you not deleting this? Their phone was she off, was she was plane. on a plane. It's, it's the same people, though, that read the headline of an article and then you go into the comment <laughs> section and you're like, you've not one. read it. And Aye. you're... you're you know, you're really uneducated in this fear. Give people a chance to represent themselves before you just go in with a pitchfox. And that, the internet's full of too many people like that. Definitely. I actually, years ago, I made a decision not to engage with anyone online because it was partly through fear. Um, because I was like, am I educated enough to put up this tweet and then deal with a big discussion that's going to come off the back of it rather than just not tweeting it? And like yourself, does anyone care about my opinion anyway? Mm. You know, so... Okay. I, I choose not to engage with those people on Twitter. And uh, it's probably Twitter that's the most pro prolific place for it. Um, did you see the story about Roseanne Barr as well? Yeah, yeah man. She that, put up, and that's completely ruined her career. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched I watched the Joe Rogan um, yep. and listened to him speak about it. And I think, like, in, in, in mainstream culture, he probably knows her better than anybody because he'd worked with her for so long and in the comedy community and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And, Every single person that actually knew her, or I get a sense that they know who this, and they'd said I spoke to her last week and stuff, so she's keeping contact. Every one of them are like, she's ill. Yeah. She's and then you hear about she was on drugs, like whatever the the drugs it was that she was Ambien. on, Ambien, and yeah. she had had a drink, and the amount of people that they were talking about, like, did you see him and he took Ambien, and you're just like you just said, man, that's somebody that's mentally fragile that said something, and and the heat at the moment went back to sleep, and there's no context. There's no context to these people. You, you no. do not know anything about them, yet you're vilifying them and you're potentially ruining their life. Mm -hmm. And that's the power that, that you've got. Did you, did you ever hear the Russell Brand, Andrew Sachs scandal? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Did do, you know, Ross? do you know how many people complained the first time that that went out? I when it was like nine or some shit. Nine complaints. Was then it actually the nine? Uh, let's just say it was nine. <laughs> yeah, it, was like, it was a I'm small number. Start, but very, very small there, number. In the BBC... <laughs> But and everybody jumped on well, it. Single it was, digits or whatever. Then it was publicised in the newspaper. And then that's when everyone complained because mm -hmm. they were all just coming to the defence of this this one guy. And to be fair, it was radio that should never have been put course, out. Right? right? But it wasn't as bad as people said. Mm -hmm. You probably had worse stuff go out on the internet since. I was magnified a hundred times. But this um, mob by mentality. The, I by the outrage. Um, it's weird. I think I see both sides this week where... Um, Tommy and his milkshake bringing all the boys to the yard with a, <laughs> um, obviously, you know, initial wave of people being like, pure, yeah, he's a cunt, like, fucking get milkshake for him. And I've actually now started to see people like, pure, how dare you use violence against cunts? And you're like, well, hold on a minute, it was a milkshake. Like, it's, you know, uh -huh. I, I get theoretically it is violence, but it's also just and a milkshake. And did you see the amount of punches <laughs> that were thrown <laughs> at the guy for throwing a milkshake on him? Because this is the, this is the hilarious thing, is that you're getting the indignant Tommy fans are like well and I hate this sort of talk as well well the the left they're supposed to be on the moral high ground you're like yeah. there was a fucking six foot five brick shit who's the uppercutted the guy after he threw a milkshake on this wee cunt do you know what I mean mm -hmm. like fuck him and it was a wee guy as well uh, yeah man it was like 18, 19 uh, year old or something did he Grown men him as well like no, I think it's come out that the guy travelled for like Blackburn to Warrington right, okay. just to basically like do this, and because okay. it had happened a couple of weeks ago and, as well, and it's, ah, right. it's definitely going to become a thing. Cool. There was a guy, there was a video where a guy on Friday had a McDonald's milkshake nowhere near Tommy Robinson, and one of his thugs went up and was basically like, "Get to fuck." <laughs> <laughs> so you can't, you can't have McDonald's milkshakes from about Tommy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go covert and black ops with a Yazoo. Have to Scotch guard all his boy suits. But he's like, I mean, I don't even know for what fucking. No, 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 no. Nah. I'm just meaning Man, just, another example we've been talking about. Aye, right? definitely. But I, I don't like talking about Myra, but that there highlights an amazing thing and a terrible thing at the same time because Tommy Robinson's probably going to get a, like, a mass amount of coverage now on yeah. people's social media that probably have tried to avoid him for a long time, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because there's parody videos out there of people throwing fucking milkshakes on him. Mm -hmm. But then what will seed through is those people that are kind of in the middle. Mm -hmm. I'm, going to, I'm going to look into what this guy's about and then he might take more supporters with him because on platforms that people consume, through these videos, they're going to start looking at more 
Tommy Robinson yeah, and stuff. Potentially. Mm-hmm. I, I say I think you should just fucking isolate these people, give them their space, and anybody that wants to follow them and then just cut them completely Boy, fucking out. Because mm-hmm. we don't want to see them on our timelines. You want to see no. good yeah. stuff, man. I think the, the heartening thing about that whole situation is, is that it seems to be anywhere he goes, he's he's getting sort of condemned. Yeah. And I think he had to run away. Like there was like about. 40 or 50 of his supporters in that Warrington High Street and there right. was a couple hundred people that were basically like get to fuck we don't want racists here cool. and he had to be like police escorted out of the high street because it was like getting uh, dangerous for mm-hmm. him and I can understand maybe people being like we can't do that and like well if you want your freedom of speech Tommy unfortunately you've got to get to the other people and if there's more of them than there is of you then that's how this works because yeah. we're living in a democracy and that's literally how this works mm-hmm. like if you're standing there with 40 50 people talking about islam this and that and and there's a couple of hundred people going fuck you you're going to need to get the fuck away from them so, yeah absolutely absolutely tough shit so fuck them what so drunk therapy yeah it's man. a cracking podcast mate like cheers buddy. really been enjoying it but he's like eight or nine in I think we just uh, released our 12th this nice week and we've recorded up to about maybe 17. Right, so you're doing them like a wee bit far. That's what we've just started doing. I know that there's people that will record their podcast, put it out the same night, but first, I just like to bank them. Me too. I'm, I'm one of those guys. I've, I'm really organised. I don't think the boys enjoy that. Right enough, I've, I've started putting out timelines going, right, we'll post this one here, this one there, um, and we'll get guests in here and everywhere. I'm just, I'm really enjoying it, man. It's... I think for me, I've, I've worked in radio for mm-hmm. 10 years now. I've uh, never been the guy in front of the mic, and I never really desired to be the guy in front of the mic. Mm-hmm. But like like yourself, I wanted to I wanted to do something creative because I used to be in a band mm-hmm. and I used to do other things. And I've kind of felt like a creative itch over the past four or five years. Um, didn't really know what outlet to be, yeah. you know, put it in. Um, and then like, I went through addiction and all that as well during that time. And so I wasn't really probably ambitious enough to do it. I was mm-hmm. dulled by addiction. And I've come out the other side of that and I'm starting to get better in my own head. And one thing, I listened to a lot of podcasts as well. And one thing that came out of the the earliest ones when we were testing it, because it takes a lot of confidence to put yourself out there. And we thought, fuck this, let's see if we can get anything. Out of it. One of the things that came out of just sitting down for an hour with a few of your mates and having a beer mm. and talking was the catharsis of it all. You know, like I, I came away after an hour with my yeah. mates and I felt lighter. And it, it just it's grew from there. Like I try and sit down with them every couple of weeks and just speak about what's in our head, whether that be like the silliest fucking observations from life or if I'm feeling anxious or yep. I went through a very shit time or I want to revisit something in my past to you know, just have a conversation about it. It's been it's been really enjoyable and That's cathartic awesome. through through these past ten episodes. And and like like you guys, it's great to meet people and um, just get to know them because and we we spoke about about this before we started the uh, recording. Mm. Was I'm I'm a bit mis misanthropic. I don't really like meeting people. I I've kind of uh, got my own wee island and. I'm always like this with my girlfriend, which is like, like, we're going out to dinner, we're going to do mm-hmm. this, and I'm like, fuck that. Mm-hmm. I, can't, I can't be fucked with people. Like, I'm going to sit and talk to this guy. I've got friends from pre addiction um, that I can't even be fucked with right now because I'm like, you know, I'm. It's a difficult one as well, especially if they're still, I mean, you know, taking part in those sort of behaviours and stuff like that. It's a, it's a tough one to be around. Yeah, yeah. And it, it isn't even that. It's just, I feel like even through those five or six years, I've changed as a person. Mm-hmm. And they, they've they changed as a person. And we're just not the same same folk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And try to explain that to my girlfriend can be a wee bit difficult sometimes, you know, because she's came through her own journey and she's still linked closely with some people and I'm I'm so far removed from that. Like, mm-hmm. I'm just this wee guy in an island. So mm-hmm. you get to do the podcast, you get to pick and choose who you talk to and mm-hmm. um, rebuild yourself in a different way and m- move yourself on. Mm-hmm. I think that's probably what, I, it, it just echoes everything that I feel that I get for the podcast. I think like there's been times when I've been looking at numbers and going, how do, I, how do I do this? How do we boost that? And then I've just came to the conclusion, oh, fuck that, man. Like, why are you doing it? Are you doing it so that other people will go, well done, great job, I love your podcast. No, no, really, like, I, I do it because no. I, I I feel the exact same way that when I do them for the rest of that day and maybe even days after it, I feel fucking amazing. I feel yeah. like I'm, 
don't really care if anybody listens to it. It's mm. like for me. This is the whole reason that I started to do it. Do you know? What when I mean? was the last time you sat down before the podcast? Uh, other than maybe the pub, right? But I think that you can be skewed in the pub because of all the noise around you, and just spoke to people yeah. for an hour and a half, maybe, and just got whatever's in your head out there. And that's the that's the premise behind mm-hmm. the, well my podcast anyway. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm assuming what yours. I enjoy about it is that I have. <clears throat> like a quite wide base of like really superficial knowledge about certain stuff and we've been able to get people into actually like beating that yeah, knowledge man. you know what I mean like, and actually explore interests and you know what people do um, and I I, I I just kind of tagged along really because he asked me to <laughs> <laughs> aye but I mean we had like for instance I'm, I wouldn't call myself a social justice warrior in the sense that I'm no like PC brigade, but I'm quite anti social justice. Like I'm a working class guy and I've seen devastation happen, do you know what I mean? And and also oh, wow. I've seen people transcend out of like that and become amazing, become great people. And um I've got a I've got an empathy for people that um especially like the universal credit. Mm-hmm. And then we had a guy on last week that's in Inverness and he, he just just one thing has really stuck with me is that he said he's disabled. He get moved for all his benefits onto Universal Credit, which cut his money up to like sixty percent. And his nearest shops a Tesco. It's twenty five miles away, and they took his mobility car off him. Fuck and I was sake. just like, I've never even thought about that. I just yeah. think about the tenements mm-hmm. and people that are in Glasgow and the homeless people that I see. Yep. I don't think about people that are fucking isolated no, in the middle of really. nowhere. And the Tories have literally just went taking your car, and the guy can't walk in a wheelchair, and you're just like. So stuff like that, like yeah. I, I like that as well. You get, you think that you know, and you're like, I'm, I'm on their side. Are you have an opinion on something, and then it just you gets... really find out, and you're like, holy fuck! Like I almost get a better appreciation for how good my life is as mm. well. Sometimes when you talk to a wide scope of people, That's you get true. that sort of, uh, like, because we all feel shit sometimes, and I go through days where I'm just like, ah, fuck, mm-hmm. man, I hate my job, and just. Do you know what I mean? Like, I need to change my job and then you talk to people and you're like, I'm really fucking lucky to, yeah. to have my work and like have making some money. But sense I, of gratitude for your I've own also, life. Definitely. I've man. also used it as a means to like explore things that, you know, I might not have previously done. You know, like so one of the big ones when we first started it was the, the guys that on the ball at the period poverty. Uh, what they're doing is amazing. I, what, that's something that they've never really crossed my mind to look into before in any meaningful capacity had I not been here doing this. Same way some of the male suicide stuff we've done in various episodes. Um and you know, in future I've been talking to him pr- pretty much non stop about like trans rights and stuff like that because I'm just reading in fully and so much stuff. And like again that's probably something that had it not been for the podcast as a as an area that I probably wouldn't have been spending a lot of time, you know, looking into Educating myself on trying to form an opinion on, and probably in this particular instance, not getting anywhere very fast. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's all a work in progress, you know what I mean? What? Opens your mind, it really, really does, and I'm enjoying it. I'm probably using it as more self exploratory mm-hmm. at the moment, and mm-hmm. I, I do like uh, finding out about people. But one of the guys, and I hope he, he doesn't mind me saying this, one of the guys that does a podcast for me suffers from really high anxiety and social okay. anxiety. And even from episode one to episode uh, 12 that we released there, you can see this guy mm-hmm. really building up his confidence and, you know, growing. That's and awesome. he's, he's done stand-up comedy and all that. And you can see that this creative wow. outlet has uh, really given him a chance to represent who he is again. That's and great. you could, like, I'm, I'm imagining him in the next couple of years just taking what he's got mm-hmm. from this podcast and this creative outlet and just fucking growing and growing and growing into the person that he definitely should be. It's definitely something that changes you. I mean, I think since coming out of uni, we've discussed that in previous episodes, like my history and that, or I've, I've always thought I was, like, I'm done with education. I don't need school anymore. Like, you know, 21, 22 years is enough. Um, but then learning new stuff here and talking to new people and, you know, learning for their experiences, I've just found out I'm going to be redundant. And it's the first time in my adult life I've actually said, oh, do you know what? What courses are out there for me? What else can I learn? How can I learn it? Where can I go? And all these kind of things. And it's like almost a bit of a, you know, all spark if we're yeah. going to talk about things in transformer terms. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're empowered, though, aren't you? Aye. Because you've you've got confidence that 
shit, this little tiny isolated world that I had before this mm -hmm. is, is not real. You know, I can walk out and do things and yeah. walk into any space that I want and then try my hand at it. It's Absolutely. It's beautiful. Until three days after the podcast where you feel like shit and you need another one. Aye, <laughs> just still hanging. Aye. But was your experiences like with addiction, if you don't mind us talking about that? Because I've had my own experience and so has Matt. Like, well, um, and I'd seen it was gambling. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm from... I'm from Ballonock slash Springburn in North mm -hmm. Glasgow, and and you guys are from that area. Yeah, yeah. Not, not well. You're a, I'm in East. I was. I grew up in Carntown. Carntown. I'm just moving to Carntown. Um, Enjoy, mate. <laughs> 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 I'm kind of, okay, I can see. I can see Celtic Park from my oh, <laughs> from my back garden. It's nice. It's nice, nice now. It's nice uh, now. It's but, definitely changed. Aye, before they took the tenements away, it was it, it was a bad area. I mean, I've said this before in the podcast. I can remember getting into a taxi. Uh, in London, and the guy's like, Where are you from? Like Glasgow, and he was like, Oh, really? Me too, where about? So I grew up in Carntine, and he went, Oof. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Really? And he was like, That's one of the places that you don't hear a lot, but it was small, but uh, it was bad. And I was like, Well, I seen the, the tail end it in the 90s, but then they took away the tenements, and it's all, it is a nice area now, mate. Yeah. Like, it really ah, is. Do you know what? I, I like a bit of scheme anyway. I, I, I was <laughs> saying that to a tax driver yesterday, and I was saying, <laughs> I like Carntine because it still feels a bit like Glasgow. It's not been gentrified. We're yeah. in the new houses, but it, you know, walk down the road and you're just in the middle of a scheme. And I'm like, that's, I, I need that. I couldn't live it's, anywhere else. It's something that's moving sort of ever increasingly east is the, the gentrification of Glasgow when you look at High Street and like Duke Street and places like that becoming like Merchant City East and all the rest of it. And you're like, Aye. you know, come on. But there's trendy and then there's the old school. And, Aye, you, know, yes, and you could go into the old pubs and going to fucking Redmond's if you want mm. but just to take it back the I so I grew up in the scheme and my mum and dad were on the social and stuff like that you know well bump the social <laughs> <laughs> old man but they have the electricity we like didn't have that, we didn't have that, but I'm sure my dad found a way to fiddle with it <laughs> it's in a wee cupboard um, so I didn't grow up with much um, but I will always remember when I was younger having a real hatred for the bookies. No, for any reason, you know, other than I, I seen that just as a leech on what was already a poverty-stricken area. And I was yeah. I was fair proud of the fact that I hadn't ever gambled in my life. Right. Um, so I, I liked football and all that, but I didn't do coupons or mm. anything like that. Um, and then I, I went to uni. I, I got a really, really good job, you know, when I was, say, 27. Um, so I've I fucked around for a few years. I did the music thing, did a few college courses, and then mm -hmm. found exactly what I wanted to do was was uh, radio at that time. And it was brilliant. I remember getting a phone call from my boss saying, that's it, you're the producer of the uh, breakfast show now on Capital FM Scotland. And I'd been working there for a few years, working my way up, and I was going, this is fantastic, this is amazing. And then fast forward two months, doing a bit of content around the Grand National. Okay. And... Um, it was, it was all very, very good, and it just it fucking hyped me up. I was like, I'm going to stick a wee bit on this. You know, mm -hmm. me and my girlfriend walked up to uh, Paddy Power on Duke Street. And I still remember it. it was the first time I've ever put a bet on, 27 years old. And it didn't come in. Can't even remember the horse or anything. But it was like, kind of opened that door just a wee bit. Yeah. And then... It's going to be one of the biggest gambling events of the year as well. It's exactly. so common for people who don't gamble to go and bet on the Grand National. And you'll put bets on for kids and all that, so it's yep. inviting that it's a family affair. Mm -hmm. And then I remember being down in London maybe three weeks later, and because gambling at that point had started to appear all over timelines and mm -hmm. really became this big digital thing. And I remember sitting at McDonald's and these two English guys talking about a free bet on Sky Bet, and mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I turned £10 into 75 I've been working my job for two and a half months at this point, and I got up at four in the morning every day. I had some money in the bank, and I'd always had this number in my head. Like, I maybe had about six grand in the bank that I'd saved up over time, and I was like, I really want to get a ten grand. And there was a guy next to me talking about a free bet that got him about 80 quid. And I'm getting up at four in the morning, and I'm busting my balls, and I'm really, really struggling with this new full-time job mm. mentality, going from being a student, a guy that worked part-time at the station, to full-time. Yeah. It was, a, it was a mental struggle to piece that together and there was also a little bit of imposter syndrome in my head as well I'm like oh, fuck I mean I'm just a wee guy for a scheme do I deserve to be producing this breakfast show yeah. am I good enough can I do this you know there's no manual on how to do it Understand. Um, so all, a lot of things were mixed in and I, I, that stuck in my head what that guy said and then I remember setting up a Skybet account and I'm going right you know what 
I'm going to see what I can do here and try and get up to this 10 grand. And mm -hmm. that that's my goal. I want, to, I want to do this. And I wonder if I can be good at this as well and, you know, make money on the side. And it's how they get you. I mean, I'm out on my Sky account five, six years ago during one of the uh, Super Bowls. Mm -hmm. And it was the same stick. Put in a tenner and get X amount of quid and three bets. And I had a ten or quid, a ten quid free bet come in on MVP. It was like Tom Brady or something. One seventy five quid and was pure. Oof, do you know? I'm five six years later, I've still got the same app on my phone. And it's and there. They've probably took that money back off me. How many times over? I don't know. Exactly. You know I mean? But it's that entrance thing into it. You know, it just gets you started. Exactly. And I was completely ignorant to betting. So you know, I've probably got mates that were grew up and been exposed to it and knew ramifications from losing money and what you should bet and what you shouldn't bet and I'm sitting in I'm sitting here with all that money in my bank but I'm not physical not in my hand mm -hmm. you know it's all digital currency at this point mm -hmm. so I'm sticking in right I don't know maybe a hundred pound first time just to fucking I bet so I've, I've no levels and I'm sticking 50 quid on a team and it'll come in and then I'm sticking 50 quid on and I think I got a bit of a beginner's luck mm -hmm. and I'm up to like four or five hundred quid and it's like fuck this is easy you know I'm getting up at four in the morning sometimes and because I knew a wee bit about tennis there was some mornings during that first few months of gambling I'm earning like I'm sitting my dad's taking me into work at the time um and because he's a taxi driver at that point he's taking me in and I'm sitting I'm going fuck I've just earned my dad's week's wages and a few hours of betting on tennis in the morning and I'm fucking feeling really really big and mm -hmm. tall mm -hmm. and then I start losing I remember I remember distinctly feeling like a, a betting god so I stuck a thousand pounds this was like two months into gambling I stuck a thousand pounds on a Novak Djokovic versus Dimitrov tennis match that I didn't know anything about. I was just fucking watching it on my phone, this little digital ball going back and forth. And I'm going, oh, but Djokovic is really good and I have no idea who this guy is. And then the terror that was going through my mind as I seen this guy starting to beat Djokovic, you know, I was coming out in sweats and I was walking around shaking my fingers like, what the fuck's happening? That's a thousand pounds. What's happening? What's yeah. happening? And I lost that one thousand pounds, and it, it just floored me, completely floored me, and I was I was just obsessed thereafter with I need to get this money back, mm -hmm. I need to get this money back. How am I going to get this money back? Well, I'm going to bet to get this money back, and it just a snowballed from there, just taking chasing that, it. chasing it, chasing it to the point where I went from like six grand in my bank account to. Minus like a thousand pounds in overdraft Oof. over a period of time, and this was this was over a like two month period. I mean that's gone up through the gears quickly, very quickly, very quickly, and that's that's how I started. And then mm. I remember, and I was doing this in work as well because you know I was um, I was in the studio, and after ten o'clock I'm sitting on my laptop and I'm just gambling away, or I'm talking to the guys and I'm watching, and I'm predominantly tennis at the time I'm watching. My money go up, my money go down. So my mood levels are going up, going up down, and I'm getting mm. all these and uh, rush of endorphins or whatever it would be in my head yeah. uh, as I win, and then hitting these real, real lows. So I'm isolating myself from the real world, really. Mm -hmm. And I remember it got to a point where my girlfriend worked in my work at the time, and I phoned her and I went, "You need to come upstairs. I need to tell you something." And that was the toughest thing that I had to do. And this was four months in. This was two thousand, must have been two thousand thirteen or something. And I said, I've just lost, over the past months, I've lost like six grand. And I've been keeping this a secret from you because it's so easy to bet on your phone. And she really didn't know what to say. But I'd opened up and I'd told someone. Mm -hmm. Then I told my big brother the same. And he, he gave me a real fucking, a real harsh talk. But helped me financially because I was going on holiday. He booked it and he helped me financially. Mm -hmm. That kind of seen me through for a, for a few months. But then... And it was stuck in my head, stuck in my head for a while. It was like I've, I've lost six grand. I'm nowhere near that ten grand now. And uh, I went back to it. I didn't tell anyone. Yeah. I didn't tell anyone. I went back to it for. And I won't. I won't go into all the detail. Of course. Um, I promised myself I'm going to save this for a full podcast for mm -hmm. the, the boys. But for the next four to five years, I I probably lost about maybe thirty, forty thousand pounds. Jesus Christ! I never had a wage that didn't go into gambling and it was, I was always just obsessed with the chasing the losses but I never realised until thereafter that those losses were massive financially but 
high level it was emotionally. Aye, uh, uh, mentally, uh, man. Just yeah. Fucking terrorizing it, yourself, it, man. It robbed me. It genuinely robbed me a lot of uh, goodness in my life. And that imposter syndrome really, really uh, magnifies when you don't really know who you are. I'm just sitting in this little fucking digital sphere where I've got this dream world scenario that now nah, this one big bet's going to come in. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm no expert when it comes to sport at all. I, I like a bit of boxing. That's that's probably what I'm good, uh, like, where I'm knowledgeable. Mm-hmm. And, and tennis at one point when Andy Murray, like, fever was coming in. Yeah. But the amount of the amount of days that I lost, I remember Saturday being the biggest gambling day because there's more football in. And I would just sit in a dark room every single Saturday for nine hours as my girlfriend goes to work, she comes back. And during those nine hours, I'm either in a great mood or a bad mood because I'm up or I'm down. And do you know what? When I'm up, if I'm up a decent amount of money, I'm trying to then bet on other things that night because it makes they keep going. There's no meaning in my life other than getting that money back or that bet. So you're chasing it whether you're up or down. Exactly. And then... It kind of reached its zenith when I remember. I remember it was a week. We could have like. Uh, I remember the last date of my last bet. It was the sixteenth of June, and during that week, um, my girlfriend's on holiday and I can't afford to go because, it, and it's for her little sister's eighteenth. All the family are there and I can't afford to go. And I'm sitting there with a credit card that I'm buying messages on because that's maybe my food for a week and I've no money and I'm like, I've got 20 quid in the bank, that's a fiver a day, let's try and get all this money back. I've taken out the loans uh, loans over the past few months that uh, equal the value of like £15,000, all of them combined. I'm like, right, we'll try this week and if we don't get anywhere, we're killing ourselves. That's it, you know, I'm sitting battling myself and I'm going, right, you know, three bets or £5 uh, bets and we'll build up from there. And I uh, I get, I get her sister comes back on the Thursday and I pick them up. I've got a work car at this point and I pick her, um, her and her uh, man up from the train station with our three month full boy. And I'm sitting with minus gas tank there and I'm driving them home to Cantine of all places. And I'm trying to justify the fact that I've no petrol in. <coughs> They're going, oh, mm. you just go to the petrol station, it's fine. Like, no, I'll, guys, I'll take you home first. All the time I'm in cold sweats, shite myself because I think the car's going to break down mm-hmm. and there's no way I can pay for petrol in it. Mm. And that, that's the, the first day. That was that was a real like horrible low point where I can't put a fiver petrol in a car to take someone home. And then I think I lost the rest, the rest of my money that day uh, online. And... Then on a Friday, I didn't have any money to gamble. So that was the date of my last bet, Friday the 16th of June 2017. And on a Saturday, I just, I remember being obsessed with, like, Ian Curtis, his story. And I'd read a lot of books, so I just surrounded myself on Enjoy Division um, stuff. Like I was reading his book, I was listening to his songs, and I was like, that's it, man, get yourself real in the headspace of trying to commit suicide. And see, I don't know if you guys have ever been in that space, but I've, I spent a lot of time researching suicide. Mm. And I found it very, very weird that there was websites that told you the most effective method to kill yourself. Yeah. I'm sitting there at three in the morning sometimes, and I'm going, right, what would be the best way? What would it feel like to hang myself? Or carbon monoxide poisoning, mm-hmm. stuff like that. And I'd, I'd tried a few weeks before to do it. Um, using a belt but I'd, I'd just pulled the belt away straight away so, so and then i remember banging the floor going i don't want to die i don't want to die I don't want to die and i'm fucking there's a few people in the loop by this point the 16th of june um but i'm still very much isolated and then on that day i just remember going to a spare room wrapping the belt around my neck and trying to make it so i was up in the air and just as i'm about to do it i'm up there for like 10 seconds i managed to get myself down and go what the fuck are you doing you know and I, I was really, really close to just ending it all at that point. And I'm so glad I didn't. Really, really glad I didn't because it was a very, very horrible, horrible day. And mm-hmm. I just decided at that moment that this is the time to get your, your shit your together. Shit together you really, really have to get your shit together, James. And what, what probably saved my life was GA. 
you know, genuinely. There was a few people, as I said, in the loop at that point, and they, they helped a little bit. But on the Tuesday, the following Tuesday, I mustered up the courage to walk up um, Duke Street and then up to the top of, I can't even remember the name of the street, but there was a GA meeting just mm-hmm. maybe yeah. less than five minutes from my house. And I walked in the door and... And then this is something that I probably should mention. You, you, when you isolate yourself that much, and you are a, you're an addict, a gambling addict especially, because there's no visible signs, and so no one really sees the deterioration. But you fucking hate yourself. You're disgusted by yourself, and you think, "I am the only one. I am a yeah. horrible creature." Mm-hmm. I remember walking into the GA that night, and there was just a guy in a suit. You know, a big guy, big normal guy. You know, and you think you think you've got a perception of gambling addicts, especially if you grew up in a scheme. It's just this wee guy goes to the pub and you mm-hmm. know the, the losers, and you're just chasing that big one all the time. And it's just like this is just a, this is a normal guy, a big, a big mm-hmm. good yeah. looking guy, and it looks like he's got his shit together. And I'm like, what the fuck? And then all these other people started pulling in. They were just normals, and it's like a the best way I can describe it. It's just like a big cuddle. When yeah. you're really, really sad, that's what that's what that was for me. I walked in, and I told my story, but it was still so raw about trying to kill myself. How I'd basically blown all my money and isolated myself in my own wee world for the past five years, and then people started saying, "I can identify with what mm-hmm. you're saying. Here's what I did. Here's my story." And I was yeah. just in a room full of people that had very, very similar stories to me that had twenty years off gambling one year off gambling that you know had tried to take their own lives that were still paying back debts that came mm-hmm. out of debts and one of the reasons i thought that I was going to kill myself was because i was i was at a point where i thought that my debt was in insurmountable mm-hmm. and the emotional uh debt that i'd you know that i had was insurmountable as well i was never going to feel like a normal person again yeah. and i was never going to be able to pay off that debt at all mm-hmm. You know, and I had this imposter syndrome, so how am I going to go back and live a real life without mm. gambling being, you know, my, yeah. my side kind of thing? Um, but that first night, I just felt like all the weight had disappeared. It just it completely gone, and there was a chance, there was a fight in me, and there was motivation to keep going and go to that next meeting and find out more about yourself and strip, strip back what happened to you and then rebuild from there. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll caveat that by saying that you know, I went to GA for maybe 10 months and it was very, very, very good for me. But I then had to move on from that because I, I wanted to do things differently in my own way. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a very, very strict program that yeah. a lot of people adhere to. And it wasn't, wasn't really like for me. People like Russell Brand's story about recovery and reading his book about recovery because that, that came out at the time when I was recovering for addiction and, and, it, and it gave me... It was really good for me, but then when you go back and you read it as well, it's almost like, where does it end, though? The bit about recovery is, that there's this whole sort of thing where you're never out of recovery, and it's like, for me, I found that, where I was like, I'm, and I, I don't like to use this sort of language, but I'm fixed. I know I'm never going to go back. Like, I've had bad things happen to me, and I've never went back, and I've slow, I could, I've slowly reintroduced where my addiction has been into my life and, like, I'm comfortable with it, do you know what I mean? And it's, like, that is one thing that, like, you're saying, and I think that the creativity really helps you with that is spending that energy in something because you're left... It's almost like I feel like my capacity for brain energy through addiction get expanded because I was thinking all the time and I was filling it up with dopamine and endorphins and... The highs and the lows have meant that my like, consciousness has expanded to this capacity where when I gave up my addiction, there was like a void. And I was like, I need to fill this void because now my brain's gone, we'll usually get this going on, so let's go and do it. And it's almost like that's yeah. where I feel the creativity come in. And I was like, I'm going to just spend this energy somewhere because it's almost like bringing it back full circle and going, right, this is what I do with my energy. I don't sit in the dark room because... I think some of the things, like, I, I relate to a lot of what you just said there, my addiction yeah. is porn, and it's so shameful, and it, and you feel like, if you picture a porn, like, when you were saying stuff there, I was just like, that's exactly how I felt, like, if you picture a porn addict, he's a wee pervert, and all that, and I was going out, and people were like, oh, Paul, you know what I mean, like, really liking you, and you're like, I don't like myself, 
I just don't feel, I feel like a scumbag, like, I don't feel good about myself, but other people are telling me how good a guy I am, and this, and I don't relate you're to You're living that. two lives, there's a, there's a complete facade and up that there. that dark room that you're talking about, people going out, and it's like four hours, and you're almost like, shut the curtains. And also, I was obsessed with Amy Winehouse, I was obsessed with Kurt Cobain, Ian Curtis, mm. people that have killed themselves, where it's almost like, romantic, and I would sit and I've seen every Joy Division documentary that's gone, mm -hmm. and even though I never attempted to take my life, I, when you were talking about that there, I was thinking to myself, fuck man, I was I was a step away from that because I was at that stage where I was reading the books and I was looking into the documentaries and even though I didn't realise it, I was probably thinking, this is a way out, this is like a legitimate way out of yeah. what I'm dealing with here. So everything that you've just said about like your, uh, your gambling addiction is totally relatable to my addiction, man. Like, Thanks for telling me that. Yeah, I totally appreciate you taking the time to share that. I think it's a really, and, and again, one of the things I've always enjoyed about the period of time I've spent in recovery or recovering is, is that moment you talk about when you actually take the step and go, it's the hardest step to take is to go and get that help, but the minute you take it, it's also the kind of the most rewarding. You know what I mean? Like, and that's a message that I don't think gets out enough. It's It's so relieving to actually go look this is what i've been doing to myself and i now get why and for somebody else to go like dude that's that's what i do and that's what i do and what i do and, and i think with me it's it's been a very sort of recent thing and um, obviously i've had uh, i've said in previous episodes a number of bouts with alcoholism um and one being very sort of recently i've been kind of dry for like three months or whatever um <clears throat> and again as you say uh, the dark room i do get because that's, you know, sending the missus after bed, the way after bed, pull the curtains, turn the light down, and spark a bottle of Jack Daniels and just see what happens, you know. And that's, I do get the dark room. That's something that pure resonated with me when we're talking. And I think it's that commonality that all addicts, you know, they feel is that, is that moment that actually it's not just me. Like we're all going through a different version of the same thing. You know so what it's I mean? Like, really, really powerful. And I appreciate you guys sharing with me as well. I think that's important. People have honest conversations about what they're going through. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I still sit in the dark room sometimes uh, just because, you know, I can't pull myself out of that from a mental health perspective at some points. But even in sober, I love the dark room. It's like so tranquil, you know what I mean? But it's so unhealthy as well. You know yeah. I mean? And I, I was thinking about this today. Um, and I used to. Like this is three days off, right? Bank holiday weekend, three days off, and I would, I would purposely go right. That's a day I can watch this program and I can just binge on that, and that's a day that I can just sit in bed. And for the past few bank holiday weekends and weekends, I'm out doing stuff. I'm pushing myself to uh, get out there and do stuff. But then I was thinking today, well, this is coming more naturally to me now. It's not a case of I'm pushing myself to go out there. I'm just doing it. I'm doing it, mm -hmm. and that to me is is very powerful. But to go back to what you were saying about that moment of relief mm -hmm. just see the first week i went into ga it, it was mental to me it, it was, i'm mind blown i'll go to one meeting and then i go to another meeting on a friday night and then on a the saturday morning i'm sitting in a guy's kitchen for breakfast in shettleston where a guy that's been off gambling for about 30 years another guy that's had 30 years off gambling a guy that's had two years off gambling i'm like fuck me this time last week because this was a saturday morning this time seven days ago I was trying to kill myself, and now I'm in someone's kitchen that I've never met before, having breakfast, yep. and the kindness of strangers it just overpowered me. I was like, whoa, this this is unreal. But it just goes to show you, if you take one step, you can be in a completely better space and place. Yeah, and almost instantly in some cases as well. Absolutely, absolutely. What do you think about, I mean, you were <clears throat> talking there, we, we were talking about this uh, before you came in, but you Yours has obviously been the the apps, which they they're built to attract you, and like we know, we're starting to get all this information now about the way that they build mobile phones. Is is that these companies like William Hill and Betfred and the matter, they've got people doing research on how do we attract people to this. It's not about you know, I mean they, they it's you get the Ray Winston advert and then it's like bet responsibly, but they, they don't they don't want you bet responsibly. That's no their bread and butter. Mm. Their bread and butter is people. Getting putting money into I think computer one of the main examples of that outside the the ten pound free bet that you get when you sign up in the first place is the frequent the, the the sort of tie between the frequency in which you get free bets after your first tenner 
and how much money you're putting in. So they can see you're putting in 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 150, whatever it is a week. And the free bet that you accumulate off the back of that also grows. You know what I mean? Like, so somebody like me who's putting a fiver on every Saturday afternoon on a coupon, every two months we'll get, here's a free fiver. But somebody who's putting 100 quid on every weekend will be like pure once a week, here's a 50 quid free bet. Mm-hmm. And you're like, hold on a minute, that's your actually rewarding really damaging behaviour. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so it's not just about that free one that gets you hooked. It's that they yeah. are actually uh, using they, these algorithms to keep you hooked they over get, longer They get psychologists time. involved in this and they've got all sorts of people doing that type of research to go, how do we keep people coming back? Mm-hmm. Um, but the one that's really striking to me is um, if you go to like Bell's Den, there isn't any really a bookies kicking about. I mean, there's like, you, you go to that bit at the sort of Bell's Den roundabout and it's like, an Italian deli mm-hmm. and it's a hairdresser's and it's all you're like oh, it's, that looks really nice but if you walk along Westmuir Street or Shettleston Road they're fucking everywhere man I'll answer them. and it's just working class communities I mean, we were thought about the one yep. in Black Hill where the pub and the William Hills are in the the, the Ranza the, 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 right the same fucking you can get there's a door that takes you through the bar straight through and I'm pretty <laughs> sure in the no so distant past you, they actually didn't have the segregation yeah. and somebody went in and went you need to put a wall and they just put up a fucking fake wall to let people to go through and thing but it almost seems like so I don't know if that is just the sort of the, the betting companies just looking at statistics and going well this postcode there's more people going through the door and why would we know open up another shop that's just yeah. good business or is it literally they know they know the, ge- the 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 demographic of people they know that they're targeting these people because if you go for i don't think the, it's a coincidence that almost anywhere in the east end you find a book if you find a pub within 100 yards yeah me neither i mm-hmm. think that's historical and then there was the was chat around the you know, fob what? team machines well you could only you could only put a, a maximum of uh, however many machines and the actual bookies so if they open another one then they can make more money off people they also like the crack machines where you <laughs> fucking guys are dropping like 500 quid a day in them yeah, yeah. Um, but I, so I genuinely about the shops than the actual betting traffic. Yeah, the, is. The, the, the actual the betting machine. Ah, uh, right. Machines. So maybe like this bus that we've seen in, uh, like Ladbrokes and Williams Hills opening up is got to do with the fact that they need to limit the amount of machines, machines that they can in have in the shop. There's right? also my my worry, my big worry because it's what I know is what you were talking about the apps, right? So I. You could probably name a betting site, right, or a bookies. And throughout the period of me gambling, I have went through there and self-excluded. So I've been on Coral, I've been on Paddy Power, I've been on Bet Victor, Bet Three Six Five, Ladbrokes, Willie Hill, mm-hmm. even obscure ones like Bet Brazil stuff like that. You know, mm-hmm. Alan Brazil's one, um, and which is mental when you think about it. But it's little triggers like my mate saying he has an offer from that for well, the fun game. Aye, aye. Uh, that I've triggered get, me. I've get, I mean, and I've never had a problem with gambling, and I've got an account with every single betting company because I've went through the free bets and exclusive bets that you get in the Champions League final. And, and the, but there, there's and so many triggers for people. Um, so my my biggest worry is the these these shops. Although I posted a video the other day of the fact that there's free betting shops right outside uh, Central Station, and mm-hmm. they're next door to each other. And I'm like, why why do we need that? But the accessibility of betting sites on your phone is blowing my mind and kids growing up they they're going to have the phone as an extension to them and i think i read a statistic recently saying that fifty thousand um children in the uk like under the age of 18 are addicted to gambling in some form or other already now they can sign up for wow. all of these yeah. sites you probably and... know their parents name date of birth probably know their parents cards exactly because it's been saved in the phone or they've put into the playstation so many times I've never even thought, because I was thinking there, why are the parents letting these children? Nah, the, the kids know their mum's name. They go out through apps Andy and Miller stuff, you know, it's not just yeah. the, mm-hmm. the gambling sites they go into, there's little things that they can navigate to gamble to an extent, because gambling doesn't just end with um, a betting site. So Gambling's like raffling, going into a competition. I had a conversation with a guy the other night. FIFA kids? This is, yeah. what I, this is exactly what I'm just going to say. Buying the, the boxes in Fortnite and buying the FIFA packs is the bare basic of gambling because you are putting, you're hoping that you're going to get 
it's like a lucky bag. So mm. like our introduction was a lucky bag. That and that might sound to people be like, that's fucking ridiculous. But no, no, no sure. I get you. Is, I get you. it's the risk and reward. So if you get a good lucky bag, or you see your mate getting a good lucky bag, you're like, Go I can remember me. people that would go in and buy like five lucky mm-hmm. bags and be like, what did you get? <laughs> what did you get? And it was exciting. And if football you go, stickers as well. Yeah, yep. football stickers. These are like entry level gambling for us, and we have grown up with that. What is the next generation gonna have to deal with mentally to try and curtail their use yeah. or like fucking blowing their money on horses or whatever it is that they want to do? Do you know what I mean? Gambling needs regulated, whether it will or not, is another story, but it needs regulated the same way alcohol and cigarettes are. Right mm. now, it's just a free for all, the amount of betting sites that are out there. Yeah. And you're talking about the psychology of these uh, companies getting right in the minds of folk that use these uh, these sites you know they're going to know so much about the next generation because all of the data that's been gathered about their habits is going to be they're going to arm themselves with yeah. it and use it just to intrinsically get inside oh, the mind yeah. of their consumers and like i said there i went through over five grand because it was digital currency i didn't have it i, I wasn't really aware of the mm-hmm. value of it because it's just there yeah. Yeah, there's going to be a generation that never handles money. You know, it's Oof. just all coming out of the Aye. bank account. And We're almost there. Tap, 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 yeah. and they, they don't see it, so they don't understand it. It's the same when you gamble online. You don't see it. You're not physically getting five hundred pound back or putting five hundred pound in. It just kind of seems flimsy. So, ah, it's like almost playing for points on an app or a game. Exactly, know? exactly. So I, I genuinely worry about the future of like children and teens because they're going to be overexposed to it and I'm a guy that vehemently hated bookies growing up and then I didn't see the correlation because it was an app and it was me just there it wasn't me being in a bookies looking around it was just this isolated situation I could put myself in Mm. and then I got lost in it and because places like GA aren't allowed to advertise it's in their rules then it does not that help readily available on TV or next to these sites? You know, there's no. I think that you should have a link to Gamblers Anonymous in every single betting site. Yeah. That so somebody can just click through and go right. Do I have a problem? But there's not. So did GA put that limitation on themselves, or is that something else? But that's that's on themselves. It's part of the rules. I'm not allowed to go out and openly market to people because it should be your decision yeah. whether you come or not. Okay. Aye, it's kind of like fair enough. Aye, you get a lot, and this is the the irony of the, sort of the social media age is that just, uh, traditionally therapists shouldn't be like try to attract people. Mm. They should be waiting for people to come to them and say I need help. Yeah. But you get these guys that have got qualifications and whatever it is and they're online and it's like they're, they're advertising like, oh yeah, yeah, I can, I can do this for you. So they're saying like, I've turned this guy for this into a millionaire. I'll do the same for you. And yeah. it's like, no man, you're manipulating people here to get like extract money. So it's the same sort of thing. You can sort of understand why Gamblers Anonymous of when let's not advertise, let's wait for people to come to us because it will be better for us. As yeah, no, I get it. It's just I'd never heard that before. So it was just, yeah. that's why I queried it. A lot of the younger people I remember being in, and you're not going to talk too much about what goes on in there, but mm-hmm, of course. There, there was there was some power struggles around that whole idea that you shouldn't advertise. There's, there's certain folk that feel you should be allowed to go on radio, take out adverts or whatever, mm. um, because it is an epidemic for a lot of young folk mm-hmm. coming through. Absolutely. Now we need to give them that knowledge and that bridge to walk over, and if we don't, then they could just find themselves in a hole and... A lot of young people very, might end up killing themselves. Very recently, Dan for Brothers in Arms was tweeting it. Uh, no, was it results of a study that showed a direct correlation between increased betting app usage and poor mental health and suicide and stuff like that? Mm. Sure. I mean, not only does it damage your self-esteem <coughs> in the sense that if you lose control of it, and like we've been talking about that, but also it's made to boost the fucking chemicals in your brain yeah. that you feel amazing, and then... The, the law that comes after that is just so devastating for people, do you know what I mean? It's... But you, the short-term memory that you get from that, the amount of times that I had that law and then said, never doing it again never the next again. day, I'm like, no, nah, I can change, you know, because it's psychologically rewired my brain to think, nah, I'll get that, I'll get it, I'll get it back, I'll do it again, mm. and this one is coming. And I now realise that's a lot of shit because I've come out the other side and mm. I'm like, do you know what, I know myself and I'm not that guy at all mm-hmm. and I'll get myself out of this whole however long it takes, and I'll I'll be a fulfilled, normal person again. Mm-hmm. Which you clearly are. So, like, well done, man. Get well, that's it, man. It's, it's a journey, isn't it? I'll tell you a story that, Matt, you'll remember this, mm. just to give fucking two fingers to 
Oh, the fuck it. I think it was Ladbrooks. Okay. The guy that stayed up the stairs for you and uh, yeah, and he he was a programmer and he built the alg some of the algorithms that were around the roulette machines, like the slot machines. And there was a bug, and he went up and down Duke Street, him and his mates. And it was if you put it on zero like four times, it just started paying out. I mean, that you bet on the the algorithm was designed to trick them or to basically work out you know what they were doing and. You know whatever, and what they were saying was you confused it by putting one on a bet on red and black and zero, and eventually it would try and whittle down near red and black and eventually land on zero and keep pinging zero out. So this guy because <laughs> you were betting on red and black and it was deliberately trying to fuck you. Hey, and so how many mates went up and down Duke Street? And they get barred out of every bit. And then, and then, aye, the phone calls are coming through. Aye, aye that afternoon he made a. I'm, I'm not even going to say the figure, but I he. Deservedly get banned out of every book he's in. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. They must have been getting phone calls because uh, there'll be people just sitting analysing what's going on and they'll be like, What's going on with that roulette machine? Get on the CCTV <laughs> and just, I but the guy fucking absolutely stuck it to them, man. So that shows you they hate you winning. They're not in it for you to Aye. win. Mm -hmm. They can't say it's no rigged when that's there. You know what I mean? If they're saying, We've got an algorithm in here that over time is 100% of the time going to fuck you, then it's a rigged deck. Exactly. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I jumped around. Hi man, do you want to wrap up? Yeah, I can. I mean, listen, like, thanks very much, like, um, for coming in, man. Like, uh, I, I honestly wasn't like aiming the conversation for you to talk about your story the way that you did, but it's again, like, I've got so much respect for people. It's so brave. Like, I know that even when I've spoke about my issues and people, are like, that's really brave. I'm like, no, don't be daft. But I've got so much respect yep, for you. Mate, I you appreciate know what I mean? that. Just man. first time you meet me and you've fucking. Absolutely pulled it out, man. Amazing. And, and if, when you do that podcast, I'm sure, I mean, it's got to be so powerful. So, well, yeah. that's that's the plan. I just want to get out my message as much as possible, my story, because I know there'll be a lot of people out there the exact same. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of people out there that can successfully enjoy gambling. Yeah. And I've got a lot, of, a lot of time and appreciation for that as well, but there'll be more and more people in the near future or in the present that are struggling with this addiction mm -hmm. um, definitely just, man you know if I can speak to them that'd be great mm -hmm. I appreciate you um, guys having me in. no not at all mate and thanks for doing the playlist so every week we're going to ask a guest to do 10 or 12 songs on a Spotify playlist and we'll fire it on Twitter and we put yours out earlier on I had a listen to it while I was setting up the room and um, I was asked you for a guilty pleasure was it the the Mavericks the Mavericks, the Mavericks. <laughs> aye, aye. that <laughs> caught me out. that caught me off guard because I was listening to it. I was going this is a nice wee Sunday playlist I was getting ready pottering about the house I was going this nice Low key beat, like you know, melodic stuff, and then pure dance the night away right in the middle. And I was like, <laughs> Yes, that's on that I had on tape when I was younger, right? Fucking, what a tune, man! What a tune. But I, cheers for doing the playlist, man. It's a good playlist, LCD sound system, two pack, like a good eclectic yep. sort of collection of songs for cheers for doing that because it's putting a wee bit of effort. And thanks for coming in, mate. No worries at all. Cheers, guys. Cheers, man. Appreciate that.